Hello. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey. Well, I have been better. I have my job is crazy. This is the only job I know of. It, I'm there's I'm sure there's others, but I got called in to work on my day off from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. So oh. I just had to Yeah. So last night I went to bed at six o'clock at night. I got up at eleven thirty and I went to work for a couple of hours. I studied for a couple of hours. I prepped for our podcast a bit. I went to a meeting at church and now I'm finally home and I'm talking to you. And as soon as we're done, I am taking a nap. Oh man. And I pushed this conversation back so that I could get ready for it by like an hour. You Ooh. sure did. Yeah. And you did they... not say a word about that when I asked you to push this conversation back. You are a gracious man. Well, you know, I know, gosh, I spent three hours listening to this chapter. I spent another two hours like highlighting in the book. And then I spent another two hours outlining it. So I know what it takes to prep for this episode. And so if you need more time, I get it. Yeah, no, this was long. I thought I was going to have some time to work on the highlighting and outlining stages yesterday and just didn't get that time because I wasn't quite done reading because my reading time got messed up. But uh, this was a long chapter and a lot of prep. I, I said to you offline, I honestly think this would have been five to six chapters of a normal modern book normal book i'm sure i'm sure wolf is happy to hear that he did not write a normal book he didn't let's be real i mean if we think about the outline for this there would have been a chapter on repentance a chapter on forgiveness maybe a combined chapter on making space and the healing of memory or two separate chapters then a chapter on embrace and covenant and then a chapter on the prodigal son, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. And well done, by the way, of outlining the entire chapter. Uh, you took three hours worth of content and just summarized it in about 30 seconds. So I guess we're done here. Yeah, no, this is, I will say this was the easiest chapter for me to follow so far, his outline. It wasn't until the highlighting and outlining stage that I saw the interrelationships between the various sections a little bit better. But at least as far as what were the main bullet points he wanted to hit, I just appreciated how clear he was in what his plan was and how he executed it. That was super helpful to me. Yeah, it really was. It made it really convenient to come back and put these notes together and, and part put some of these highlights under their appropriate heading and go, okay, this is how it all fits together. So I do think it's going to make it you know, hopefully good to talk about, but there's a lot of content to get through. Yeah, I think we may have to give up on sharing other thoughts if this takes as long as I suspect it might. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. We'll see how much time this takes. I'm totally willing to give up our thoughts in order to document Wolf's thoughts, which are just phenomenal. It, it deserves uh, some good time and attention. Absolutely. Well, so where do you want to get started? I'd love to just start exactly where Wolf does because he starts with a thesis and then an outline. And you've already given the outline, but you know, our listeners are literally listening to this. And so it's probably helpful to go back through that. Um, and so I'll just quote his thesis. This is on page 98. The central thesis of the chapter is that God's reception of hostile humanity into divine communion is a model for how human beings should relate to the other. In other words, we have to model exactly what Jesus did to welcome the other. And that's what embrace really means. This chapter is all about an embrace. And so he explores four content areas that he thinks need to be explored in order to understand the model that Jesus gave us. And then he applies it, or he illustrates it, in kind of two ways. The illustrations he'll get to are an extended look at the prodigal son, and also a look at the driving metaphor for this 
book, which is the idea of embrace. So he's going to illustrate his thoughts through those two pictures. But his outline that we're going to get through is repentance, forgiveness, freeing up space for the other, and this idea of healing our memory, which I found was really fascinating. Yeah, I'm very curious to get there. That is one of the sections that I I'm curious to hear your thoughts about. But even before, what's interesting to me is, so he says all of that, and then as he often does, he acknowledges that he's not speaking into an empty room. That is to say, he's not just working with a blank whiteboard where there aren't pre-existing thoughts. He Mm. recognizes that for most of us, the space that he is going to be speaking into the mental categories that he wants to offer are going to be a replacement in some ways of this value of freedom. And so he wants to talk about the fact that freedom as a unifying social theme has significant and complicated limitations. Yeah, I love that. I mean, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room or we have to acknowledge the prevailing view if he's going to give his perspective on what he thinks is true, he has to address what the prevailing view is. And the prevailing view is the supremacy of freedom, right? We in the United States, particularly, freedom, freedom, freedom. That, that's what July 4th has come to symbolize. It's what is built into our mantra as to who we are as a people. Everybody just has liberty and freedom. And that is has been enshrined as the highest goal. And particularly when we talk about this idea of victim and perpetrator, what we're searching for in most of our constructs is freedom for the oppressed, freedom for the victim. And that model prevails in our society. But he says, as good as it is and as necessary as the components of understanding victim and perpetrator, that's still necessary, but it is insufficient and ultimately incomplete. Yeah, exactly. It's not that it's wrong to say this person is a victim and this person is a perpetrator. You know, coming way back to the beginning of the book, his goal is to be able to go up to somebody on the opposite side of his own cultural divide and be able to embrace them, literally to be able to hug them. Mm -hmm. The search for freedom will not get him where he wants to go. And I think if I take that thought and put it into even our own context, as long as what I am defending is freedom as the highest good, again, not saying that freedom is a bad thing, but if that is my highest good, that ultimately is deeply fracturing to a society. And I think that's a fascinating observation. Yeah. I mean, and that fracturing really comes in a couple of different ways. One, it paints the picture as though one party is 100% the victim and the other party is 100% the perpetrator. And that's just not how the world works. We're all messed up in some way including, quote-unquote, victims. Now, not to say that we're blaming the victim. That is clearly not what he's saying. But he's saying the world doesn't fall into nice, neat categories like that. And we kind of do violence to the true narrative if we want to pigeonhole the situation like that. But then he illustrates this, I think, by showing the other side of the problem with just focused on freedom, is what happens when the victim wins out? All of a sudden, they have been liberated. They have received this freedom. What restrains the victim from becoming a perpetrator? If all that we've done is created liberty and freedom and the opportunity to choose one's actions, we have not put any safeguards in place to make sure that the violence doesn't repeat from either party. And even more than just putting safeguards in place that ensures that it won't, He seems to be arguing that there are safeguards that ensure that it will happen again. You know, hearing all of this in the context of what he said about sin in the previous chapter, 
you know, we we were talking in our last conversation about the fact that reading his last chapter, I I felt like sin was more pervasive and therefore even more difficult for me to see than I had originally thought. Mm. And he assumes that background and really seems to be saying that both the oppressor and the oppressed are both in a social context that has tainted them with a kind of sin that even in the process of rebelling against the stated social order, the victim is still subject to the assumptions made by the unstated social order. Did I say that right? Because that was a hard thought to say. Yeah, I'm not sure that I followed, but having read the chapter, I'm wondering if you're saying that the oppressor sets the terms of the oppression, and the victim, as soon as they achieve liberation, they often operate under those same ideas and those same premises of what constitutes real power, of what constitutes privilege and all of those things. And they turn around and they dump that same matrix onto the former oppressor. And now the cycle repeats because nobody has bought into a different narrative. They're all operating with the same rules of engagement. Yes, that's exactly it. And it's this this narrative that is agreed upon by the oppressor and the oppressed about what power means, about what success means, about freedom. He's calling attention to something that in the normal course of revolution isn't even noticed. I think that's the thing that was interesting to me. Mm. It's not like the victim rises up and says, well, we agree on... How does he say this? He says, the victim and the oppressor agree on what game is being played. They just want to change sides. Mm. And yeah, when he, yeah. yeah, when he brings us to this idea of repentance, what he's basically, I think, saying is the only way to escape is to agree that it's time to play a different game. Yes. And that different game, oh man, I thought this was just one of the, one of the shining moments of this chapter. He says the different game is reconciliation. And nothing mm. about the emphasis on freedom itself promotes actual reconciliation. Now, he says the final reconciliation, the final restoration, that's a messianic problem. That's God's to solve. He's going to do that at the end of the story. We have to live in a world of enmity, in a world of danger, in a world of real oppressors and real victims and real conflict. And we have to decide how we are going to promote this new narrative of reconciliation as a replacement to the same old song and dance that has just been grinding the gears of humanity all these years. Wow, this is one of at least two different places where he presents an eschatologically driven way of living, right? We are mm -hmm. informed by the end of the story without trying to enact the end of the story. This is some of the best applied eschatology that I've ever heard. Oh, for sure. For sure. Well, and so with that backdrop, I don't know if you're ready, but I'm ready to dive into these bullet points because each of them kind of depict how reconciliation actually takes place. Mm, yep. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. So. The first of these, of course, is repentance. And his major theme that I got out of this, which is really responding to some theological streams that may not be prevalent to our listeners, you know, he is clearly wrestling with the kind of liberal liberation theology movement. But the fact that victims and oppressors need to both repent. He expects a lot of pushback on that. And so he spends a large chunk of this bullet point making the argument that the oppressed are the ones who need to repent as much as the oppressors are, even if for different things. Yes. 
And that is jumping ahead a little. I'm going to be jumping ahead just a slight bit because he has a definition of repentance that I think is really key to jump in here. But before that, I thought his rationale for why we need repentance, I think it's obvious why a perpetrator would need to repent. But why does a victim need to repent? Why does, mm. well, maybe I will throw the definition in here because his definition of repentance, he says to repent means to resist the seductiveness of the sinful values and practices and to let the new order of God's reign be established in one's heart. In other words, exactly what we were just talking about, how we don't want to play by the same old rules anymore. We want to let God's new order be established in our hearts. And that's what repentance, turning around, adopting a new worldview entails. And he says, this is what I found so fascinating. He says that that restores human dignity to the former victim. And mm -hmm. that was so key because all of a sudden then they have a choice. Just like Jesus had a choice on the cross as the victim of a lynch mob, and he asserted his own human dignity to choose a different narrative, the narrative of grace, the narrative of forgiveness, the narrative of repentance. And he said, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they do. That is restoring his human dignity because he was allowed to make a new choice. Oh, you just hit something that I think is brilliant and that I hope all of this comes together and makes sense. But if I can use an illustration here, my daughter and I were having a conversation last night. I told her we were going to be having dinner. She was voting to not have to all eat together as a family. And I said we were going to be eating all together as a family. And she said, then I don't really have a choice, do I? And I said, no, no, you do have a choice. And I was trying to articulate what is the choice that you have? Because freedom means more than living in a world without constraints. Mm. And this is exactly, I didn't say that to her. I wanted to say that to her, but listening to you just gave me the language for this. Sometimes we have the freedom of choice, but we always have the freedom of narrative. And the narrative freedom that she had that I think was really important and she wasn't catching and I wasn't able to articulate was, you have two ways of looking at this. You can say, dad is making me do this and I don't want to. Or you can say, we are doing this as a family and I am participating. But you can tell yourself whatever story you want about this moment, regardless of whether I am giving you options. And that is a freedom that no one can ever rob us of, is the, the freedom of the narrative. You're exactly right. And the importance of that narrative is highlighted in Wolf's own words here, where he says, without repentance for these sins, without adopting this worldview, the full human dignity of victims will not be restored and needed social change will not take place. It's the linchpin yeah. to all of this. Yeah, that's it exactly. And again, I think this only makes sense with all of what Wolf said in the previous chapter about how pervasive sin is. We are all playing the same game. Yes. And I know my example with my daughter was a simple one, but anything from there, moving all the way up through personal conflicts, moving all the way through group conflicts within a culture, moving all the way to cultural conflicts and wars, to ask ourselves, as people who are following Jesus, am I still trying to play the same game, or am I interested in playing the new game? And there's no way we're moving on until we actually wrestle with that question. Right. And you know, in the theological order of things that we're all familiar with, what follows repentance? Forgiveness. And that's mm -hmm. clearly his next bullet point. But I am thrilled uh, just in terms of the flow of our conversation right now, because I also have a story about me and my daughter, but it's illustrated by this next bullet point of forgiveness. And he talked about forgiveness being really, really hard because 
we don't like to be wrong. And the problem is, again, when conflicts are messy, it's not as though the other person is 100% right. Mm -hmm. Like, there's this mixture and like, it almost feels wrong to offer forgiveness when they're clearly guilty of some things. And I would really like them to repent of those things and admit their guilt so that I don't have to feel so pressured by their lack of insight into that. So they've got some mess that they need to deal with. And yet I have some mess that I need to deal with and I need to forgive. I need to repent even though it's messy. And that is really hard. And so my story that illustrates this again is a simple one, but boy, did it resonate with me as I read this chapter. The other day I was getting on my daughter because she hadn't been keeping up with chores. And if there's a pet peeve of mine, it is, you know, the family not pitching in to help out around the house. And because it's a pet peeve, boy, it really fired me up. And my way of confronting her was with an elevated tone and a lot of aggravation in my voice. And that was not producing good results. And so she was aggravated with me for flipping my lid. And I was aggravated with her for not keeping up with the chores, even though I had a clear expectation for that. And we were deadlocked. And I knew the only way to undo this deadlock was for me to offer some forgiveness, but also for me to do some repentance. And mm -hmm. that was so challenging because she was entrenched in her position because I had I had been so elevated. I had been so aggravated. And she, so she didn't want to back down. And I definitely didn't want to back down because she was wrong. Dang it. She needed to do more chores. Just say that you agree and I will move on. But mm -hmm. it, I, I still had some things I had to deal with. And so Boy, it's amazing. It's not this isn't just international conflict. I mean, this is everyday stuff. Yeah. Well, and this is a great observation that I think you're absolutely right happens in parenting as well as in marriage as well as in every other relationship. The deadlock has to be broken by somebody being willing to repent and forgive and to anticipate what he is going to say in his description of the four movements of embrace, this is the moment where there's incredible risk, right? Yes. Because you open your arms wide and then wait to see what the other person's going to do. And when you open your arms that wide, you are very vulnerable. Yeah. And he brought a couple of stories of the Bible together for me in ways that I'd never seen. Because I think mm -hmm. in that moment... We fear that vulnerability and we say, okay, well, if they're going to behave that way, the only real safe way to win and not open up myself to vulnerability is I'm just going to take that to the whole next level. Mm -hmm. And he uses this story of Lamech in Genesis where he says, yeah, yeah well, if, if, right, if Cain was avenged seven times. Well, then Lamech is going to be avenged 77 times. I'm just going to go whole hog into revenge and nobody is going to get one over on me. And that same 77 times is the same measure that Jesus used when he said, no, 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 that's how much you have to forgive. And I'd never caught the 77 in both instances or the 70 times seven, however you want to say it. No, absolutely. We talk all the time about what does Jesus mean by 77 times? And I think this is the clear answer, right? What Jesus is saying is, as long as you don't want vengeance to win, that's how often you need to forgive. Hmm. And I really appreciate it. You know, he wrestled with this idea of vengeance, and then he wrestles with this idea of justice. And I loved this quote. Only those who are forgiven and who are willing to forgive will be capable of relentlessly pursuing justice without falling into the temptation to pervert it into injustice. Hmm. That is such a profound comment. He clearly is anticipating this argument about forgiveness, that forgiveness breeds injustice. Doesn't forgiveness just let the perpetrator get away with it? 
And his response to that is so powerful. No, 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 no. The only person who can authentically enact justice, or he actually uses this language, again, that I love. He says, every act of forgiveness enthrones justice. Yes, yes. If I am willing to deal with the ways in which I need to forgive and the ways in which I need to be forgiven, it is only after both of those two processes are begun that I can actually pursue justice in a way that is honest about not being vengeance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I have no right to claim that I even can tell the difference. Yeah. Forgiveness names justice, says this was wrong, and I release the dead. And he said that that choice, that forgiveness, is to bring it back to the title of the book and why he's talking about exclusion and embrace. He says, I love this quote, forgiveness is the boundary between exclusion and embrace. Mm -hmm. You have to cross that Rubicon. You have to cross that moment of enthroning justice, saying that was wrong and I release it. Now I open up my arms and I am prepared for an embrace. That is what forgiveness requires. Well, and this is where I love the fact that he asked the question, how do we find the strength to forgive? And again, the beauty of his language on this, he speaks of prayer as the place where we find the strength to forgive but not in the way that I would typically think. As an evangelical Christian, I think of my response in prayer to this kind of anger or this kind of hurt or offense to be that I come to prayer and say, God, I have been hurt and I know I'm hurt. Please give me the strength to forgive. Please help me. He prescribes, based on the Psalms, a very different response which is to pour out your rage in prayer. I love this sentence. Rage belongs before God, not in the reflectively managed and manicured form of a confession, but as a pre-reflective outburst from the depths of the soul. Yes. Yeah, because that, to me, that's where justice is enthroned. You're saying this is unjust, and I bring to you, God, all of my wrath, all of my anger, all of my hurt, all of my discouragement that this is the way it is, and it shouldn't be. And I'm placing it before you. And in the process, I am placing both myself and my perpetrator, and now bring healing. Mm. That's a powerful prayer. Yeah. And we talked about this a lot when we were going through the Psalms throughout the summer, but I just appreciate his willingness to wrestle with and reckon with the fact that authenticity in our relationship with God, both about what has been done to us and about who we are, all in the same moment, is an incredibly, incredibly transformative experience. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to dive in now to this third point about making space for the other, because I think this is one Mm. of those things that is actually really complicated theology in a way. So I do want to dive into the theology, but maybe this is a good moment to bring in his overall analogy of the embrace, because that's his guiding metaphor. And so you're opening up your arms, and you then you are waiting. And you are allowing space for the other. The open arms are an invitation that says, you, please come to me. I lack without you. Please come. I invite you. But it is not just like running over and hugging somebody and just stealing that hug. It is opening and letting them respond. And I think that that helps guide my thoughts at least for what it means to make space for the other. But then he also tackles this theologically, and and particularly with the Trinity, which I just love. In fact, he even brings in John Zizulis. So like I was just gonna say this. Your guy made it in here. Yes, Um, exactly. You know, I'm sure that John Zizulis would be thrilled to know he's your guy. Um, 
but nevertheless, yeah, this he's is suddenly it. elevated. Yeah. Yes, that is an elevating thought. Um, but I would not have known who this was, but some of your comments in the episode, the Trinity episode, I was deeply indebted to what you said in that episode in order to understand some of the stuff that Wolf was saying in this segment about the Trinity and how it related to the topic of this chapter. Yes. And I'm just so excited by this theology. This theology is so rich. And if I can capture it, I would say it's it's a re- realization that everything in the world exists because of the intertrinitarian love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their relational dynamics, their connection with one another, their interrelatedness while still remaining distinct in their own personhood is so foundational for how we understand all that exists out of their creation and out of their love. And we have to realize that that is the definition of self-giving love. Not only that they love one another, but that they would create a whole world and donate themselves, donate the Godhead to that world, and even give themselves up in the person of Jesus dying on a cross to redeem and restore and invite back in that fallen humanity. And not only that, that's who we become as followers of Jesus. We become this ecclesial community. We become part of what it means to follow this intertrinitarian God. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, communion, whatever you call it in your context, we are celebrating that very thing, this self-donating God who reconciled us to himself, but also reconciled us with one another. And that profound act is so rich. Yeah, I was really caught by this phrase, mutual interiority. The fact that there is an interpenetration of being here that, again, is deeply captured by uh, the Eucharist, by communion. I'm not just participating in the death and resurrection of Jesus. I am taking Christ into myself, taking the Godhead in Christ into myself. That was a really profound thought for me. First of all, what is most natural for the Godhead is for God to be self-giving of himself, allowing a, a other than God and frankly, a less than God individual to take God into himself or herself, but in my case, himself. And then second, to see that as the model for what it means to respond as an image bearer of God to a person who is other than myself, that God is not evaluating whether or not I am worthy of that as a point of inclusion versus exclusion. Right. I am therefore most Christ-like when I am making room in myself for someone who is different from me, for me to make room for someone else in a way that is vulnerable, the way an embrace is vulnerable, that is profound and heavy stuff. It really is. And I really like where he takes it next, because if we really allow the profundity of that to sink in, I think one of the questions we naturally ask is, wait a minute, I as a victim have to make room for the perpetrator? And Mm -hmm. I have to think it's a good idea that we all live in heavenly bliss under the one triune God? Like, do you know what that person did to me? That's not a good idea. I don't want to share a space with that person. I don't want to share an inheritance with that person. I don't know if I even want to see Jesus put a white robe on that person, right? And he even kind of uses that illustration in this book. 
Um, and I appreciate his vulnerability there because that's real. And that's where he talks about this really interesting thing, memory. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a vivid memory of what that perpetrator did to us. And that memory is important because it keeps us safe. And we realize that person is not safe for us. And we have to maintain that memory for now. But in order to be finally redeemed, in order for all of us to actually be reconciled in the final reconciliation, again, a messianic problem, then the Messiah, God, is going to have to erase the memory. We can't undo what was done, but it can be non-remembered, which I think was an interesting term. Yeah. Again, this is that eschatological application that I am so grateful for. On the one hand, he seems to be saying, we don't have to do the ultimate forgetting because God is going to do that for us. But we do, on the other hand, have to live in light of the fact that forgetting and being in a safe place where forgetting is okay is the end of the story for us. Yes. I had never really taken the time to think about the full implications of the fact that God forgets our sin. You know, as far as the East is from the West, He's removed our sin from us. That that would have an impact on how I remember or don't remember everything that happened to me. And the, the bliss, the restoration that can happen when everybody is legitimately purified and legitimately set free of the memory of when that wasn't so. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I was caught by the same idea. You know, if you are interacting with someone, let's say you have a boss that takes advantage of you and then apologizes and then takes advantage of you and then apologizes and takes advantage of you and apologizes, he refers to remembering that history as indispensable in this world. Mm -hmm. But that indispensable remembering is guided by the fact that the greatest grace we will experience is to live in a place and then be given the grace to be able to forget safely. All mm. coming out of this one phrase from Paul, the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed. All remembering is comparison, right? It's not even worth it. And we don't have to yeah. be there today, but we will be there someday. Yeah, 100%. So I don't know about you, but I feel like that's the thrust of this chapter. And I feel like his illustration with the actual embrace is wonderful. And his reflections on the prodigal son story are wonderful. But this idea of covenant that he throws in between feels almost like a side quest. It doesn't seem to follow for me the whole thrust. I guess maybe the way that it fits is, okay, if we want to take these concepts and, and remove them from just the individual for a moment, and we want to put them at the macro level, the societal level, we might have to look at it through the lens of covenant and how God's moral order structures the covenant. I think all of that is super valuable. It's good theology, but I'm almost tempted to just brush past it for the purposes of this conversation. But if that's leaving out something super key for you, I, I don't want to rush past it. The only thing I'll mention is that this, again, ties into something you brought up a few weeks ago. You talked about the fact that God in Christ was in a covenant with all of creation that could not be broken. Your comments about that in that previous conversation actually prepared me to be ready to listen with a different lens and mm. allowed me to hear something about the way Wolf is understanding the covenant that is different from my typical reformed background evangelical, the covenant is with a limited group of people, and different from universalism as well. And I just appreciated this mental image of the cross 
making a covenant with creation as a whole, but a covenant that involves God with open hands waiting. Yeah, for sure. We've talked a couple of times about this open hands waiting kind of moment. And do you know what this makes me think of? You're going to laugh because I know you know this movie. I'm thinking of if the movie you say Hitch. Zoolander. Okay, much no. better. Yeah, okay. no, Hitch. Because there's this great scene in Hitch where Will Smith's character is trying to teach Kevin James's character how to kiss. And they're standing on yes. the step. And no, I thought of this exact same thing. Right. Yes. So he's like, okay, so this is how it goes. And you come in 90% and you yep. show that you're ready to kiss and you wait for her to come the other 10%. And so he's like, okay, go ahead, practice. And so Kevin James just goes the whole way and kisses him. And he's like, he freaks out. He's like, oh, you don't go the whole way. You know, <laughs> I said 90 and then I come 10, you know, it's this great scene, but that's exactly what's happening with this open arms thing, right? Like, I'm I'm oh, opening. Man. I am ready to receive, but I'm not going to come the full hundred percent. I'm going to wait for you. It's exactly right, and that's a great illustration. And I hadn't written it down, so I didn't think of it in this conversation. But yes, there are a number of very insightful moments in the movie Hitch. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. And, almost and as insightful of, as Wolf himself. Almost, almost. So if I can, for just a minute, I'd love to dive into his kind of culminating thoughts in this chapter, because as he says, they're really foundational to the whole book. It was on his reflections on the prodigal son that he really started the genesis of his uh, of his thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I have been looking forward to this story because I think you even mentioned it in our very first episode about exclusion and embrace. So I've been really looking forward to talking about it. Uh, as you read his telling of the story of the prodigal son, what strikes you? I think his emphasis on relationship. And that, I've never really weighed that out, honestly, in my analysis of the story. But he says, look, everybody is referred to in relational terms. Father, mm. son, older son, brother. Right. These are relational terms. And, and even so, then he even says, okay, so the whole story is what relationship are these people going to hold? So the younger son tries to unson himself. He tries to mm -hmm. pretend as though his father is dead and he has no father. And the older brother doesn't welcome him back. He tries to separate himself and pretend he has no brother because his brother is dead to him. So it's, again, relational terms, whether we're going to think of them positively or whether we're going to try to undo the existing relationship. And I thought that was a really insightful way to look at this. Yeah, I agree. This was the one of the two things that really struck me the most was the fact that the nuance that I'd never really picked up of Nobody's called by name in the whole story. They're all called by these relational terms, father, younger son, older son, whatever. But then the act of exclusion in that context of saying that son of yours, as opposed to my brother. Right. And things like that. I thought that was really profound that in this case, the older brother is making a relational statement in just a few words. And uh, kind of contra that example, when the older father says, this son of mine, right? Like the emphasis on restoration of relationship. I think you're right. I think this was really, really fascinating. And then the other thing that caught me was the way in which Wolf points out the fact that the father and the son aren't mirror opposites of one another. It's not like the older brother rejects the younger brother and the father accepts the younger brother and that's it. And this is something that he talked about earlier in the chapter, I think, if I'm remembering where it was correctly. Uh, he talks about how the older brother, in characterizing the younger brother, is trying to stand up for this sort of cultural value that is perfectly appropriate, that celebrating the younger son is celebrating wastefulness. And yet, in standing up for that, 
by trying to have a righteous or just perspective on that, he inherently becomes oppressive and simplifies the story down. You know, Wolf identifies the fact that the father is wasting his resources rather than the father's, or uh, the older son, I mean, the younger son, excuse me, wasted the father's resources rather than what was ultimately going to be the younger son's himself. All the ways that the story gets simplified into a black and white version of the story, I thought that his observations there were really intelligent. And then balancing that off with the father who welcomes the son back, but not in a way that denies the story. He reinstates him, but his part of the inheritance is still wasted. And everything that the father now owns belongs to the older son. Yeah. I, I just, all of that was really interesting and nuanced to me. And I, I thought as a model for understanding exclusion and embrace, I thought he caught a lot of interesting stuff. He did. And I think his emphasis on how the older brother was really seeking justice. There needs mm -hmm. to be justice. There needs the younger son did wrong, not just a little bit, but a lot. He broke all sorts of cultural norms. He broke all sorts of rules of decorum and respect. He spat in your face and walked away. You can't just ignore that. And so he's calling attention to the justice. And I think it, Wolf is going to get into this in the next chapter, which is really cool, this idea that grace itself is an act of injustice, that the father- I, That was such a good quote. Right? That the father's will to embrace, the father's will to restore relationship superseded the justice of a broken rule, mm -hmm. that relationship is prime, and this sense of- Justice over rules is secondary, and that's uh, that's a challenge. It is. I know he's going to work out that thought quite a bit more in the next chapter, and I'm really looking forward to wrestling with that with you because that is not the way we as evangelical Christians normally act, and myself included. Uh, we don't put the relationship in the primary place. And so I'm really just looking forward to wrestling with that in the context of his larger argument he's going to make about it. Yeah. What a good teaser for next week. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and again, if we take this as a moment to turn to our conversation partners that are listening with us, I'd actually be curious for folks to comment is there anything as you were reading that we didn't comment on that you thought was significant or perhaps an element or idea or quote or takeaway that you had as you were reading all of this? Please comment on our social media or email us individually if it's more private. But I get so much out of hearing what other people were thinking when they were reading. And it helps me see writing in such a different angle that I am genuinely looking forward to folks sharing a little bit about what they had, even if it's just uh, a post, you know, and I send these to you sometimes about other things. Uh, I will underline something in a book that I'm reading, that a print book that I'm reading, and then I just take a picture of the page and send it off to you because it's the easiest way to say, this is what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Any way that people can share their thoughts with us, I would just be so curious to hear. Yeah, I absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to extending out, having multiple conversation partners on this because it's such good stuff. But exactly. as we suspected, we did run over our thoughts segment, which is great. I think this was awesome to dive into, but I wouldn't mind ending on a which Josh question just because they're fun. Mm-hmm. Well, so, and the other reason I want to get to this is because I'm actually super curious about the answer, which I know kind of gives away, but like, which Josh has broken federal law and I guess is willing to answer to it on a podcast? And as you are alluding, since you're curious about it, that's me. I have apparently broken federal law 
and did not know it at the time, though I did do the federal law breaking with you. Oh, oh, I'm guilty too? Nope, you were present, but not guilty as far as I am aware. Uh, so, okay. uh, Lighter sentence, when, okay. Yeah. When we were on vacation uh, a few months ago, I grabbed a bunch of rocks to make a little reminder of how beautiful it was in Utah and Arizona in my office. And I set it up and was chatting with a friend of mine who used to live in the Southwest. And he said, you know, that's illegal, right? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you can't take rocks from national parks. And I looked it up and it is in fact illegal. You can take a rock and that is it. (laughs) <laughs> and there are several national parks that I took more rocks than that. And I mean, the law like has all lots of words in it. Like you cannot take rocks, sand, go rock hounding, blah, blah. Like it's clearly they do not want people to do this. And I just, it, it did not occur to me that that was a thing. I, I didn't break the rocks off of anything. They were normally right near like the parking lot of the spot where we were parking. But apparently it- Please, and, please and proceed makes, with your justification. Yeah, No, well, I was going to say it makes sense. You do not want thousands of people taking rocks from the national parks. Right, right. Right, like now I have them and I don't know that I can do anything to make it right. Uh, but <laughs> I, I have apparently- broken federal law. So that's and, awkward. And by your own admission, you were a serial offender. Yes, I was eating cereal the whole time. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we should probably let the feds do their investigation. And if we can, maybe we'll record another episode next week. Sounds like a plan. Chapter five, oppression and justice for next week, huh? <laughs> Oh, we should name the title. Uh, what are we doing next week? So, oh, it is literally chapter five: oppression and justice. That's that's actually the title. Oh, I hear I was thinking you were joking. Okay, <laughs> nope, I am not. It is literally chapter five. I looked at it to read it: oppression and justice for next week. All right, I'll get my head screwed on straight between now and then. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Thanks for the good combo. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.